Move on now to the, is this the ninth study, I believe? Yes, ninth study on Sunday afternoon here at the British Columbian Camp, 1983. We're now ready to look more seriously at the statement in um, Matthew chapter 11 in regard to taking the kingdom of heaven by violence. Now, I'm spending some time on the true science of prayer and various elements in this true science because of the men of faith and prayer through whom God will finish the work in the very, very near future. Unless we learn the mighty power of prayer and how to approach our Heavenly Father, we're going to find ourselves unfit to join in that last great work and what uh, a disappointment that would be, what a loss that would be, in fact it would be eternal loss. In the Bible Commentary, Volume 5, there is on page 1089, 1089 a very clear statement in regard to what these words mean from Matthew chapter 11, and certainly a very, very challenging statement to say the least of it. And uh, it reads as follows, With the great truth we have been privileged to receive, we should and under the Holy Spirit's power we could become living channels of light. We could then approach the mercy seat and seeing the borough promised, kneel with contrite hearts and seek the kingdom of heaven with a spiritual violence which would bring its own reward. We would take it by force as did Jacob. Before I go any further, uh, 1089 in volume 5 of the Bible commentary. Okay. Now I want you to notice the reference to Jacob and uh, that should remind you of the fact that uh, a moment or two ago we also found Jacob being referred to in the book Desire of Ages in connection with um, in, in connection with the import, importunate cry of the nobleman who desired to have his son delivered from death. On page 198 the word says like Jacob he prevailed. And um, in this other statement from the Bible commentary, we would take it by force as did Jacob. So very obviously then the experience of Jacob is an illustration of the taking of the kingdom of heaven by violence or by spiritual violence, which, was, which had developed since the days of John the Baptist. I'll go a little further. Then our message would be the power of God and the salvation. Our supplication would be full of earnestness full of a sense of our great need and we would not be denied. The truth would be expressed by life and character and by lives touched with the living call from off God's altar. When this experience is ours, we shall be lifted out of our poor cheap selves that we have cherished so tenderly. We shall empty our hearts of the corroding power of selfishness and shall be filled with praise and gratitude to God. We shall magnify the Lord, the God of all grace, who has magnified Christ and he will reveal his power through us making us a sharp sickles in the harvest field. <clears throat> now we'll turn to the study, a little study of the life of Jesus for a moment or two to help us to better appreciate what it means to come before the mercy seat with a spiritual violence which brings its own reward. In other words, very obviously, of course, the sheer intensity of our prayer, which intensity springs from a sense of our great need, has in it a power which penetrates through unbelief and darkness, reaches the throne of God and brings a response from him which is much more immediate and much more powerful and otherwise would be experienced. Now, remember I read um, a statement from the book Education, page 258, which says that for any gift that God has promised, and then there's given a list of those gifts, I'll take time out to just re read them again now. After quoting the verse from uh, Mark 11:24, the statement says, He makes it plain that our asking must be according to God's will. We must ask for the thing which he, which he has promised and whatever we receive it must be used in doing His will. The conditions met, the promise is unequivocal. And here comes a list of things we can ask for that God has promised. For the pardon of sin, has God promised that? Most definitely. For the Holy Spirit, what is the scripture text that tells us that? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall our Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? For a Christ-like 
temper as God promised us a Christ like temper definitely for wisdom and strength to do his work now that's a particular that promise is very precious to me because and it, and it must become very precious to you too because when God lays upon you a burden of ministry of any kind you're going to find it will be very taxing on your physical resources as well as of course the need for wisdom to do the work which God has given to you to do so for wisdom and strength to do his work for any gift he has promised we may ask then we are to believe that we receive and return thanks to God that we have received what were you reading from? education 258 right now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40 because there is a very specific promise that is, that is made to those who wait upon the Lord to receive a revitalization of their physical energies Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31 the 31st verse in the 40th chapter of Isaiah but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint and when in the book education we find the statement reads that for wisdom and strength to do his work for any gift he has promised we may ask and, be, and believe that the gift is ours Welcome. Hello, <laughs> it's good to see you. We'll be missing you. Well, I must carry on. <laughs> We're glad to welcome Brother Abe Harder to camp. A little late, but better late than never. Now, back to our text again, Isaiah 14, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, <clears throat> when we read these promises we have to believe that, that w w what God said he really means what God says he really means it doesn't mean that these are kind of um, nice words of rhetoric that God is being carried away with himself and doesn't really mean what he says as I've had the experience of some people saying to me now for instance uh, several years ago I was in Germany and a young Dutchman who had spent some years in Australia and could therefore speak good English came to me and said uh, words like these bearing in mind of course that he was in the Brinsmead camp and um, as you know the Brinsmeads do not believe in the eradication of the old man they don't believe in the specific promises of God they kind of regard these things as being more or less uh, platitudes or enthusiasms in God's part but hardly realities and he said to me now I know these great promises that you read to me I know what the word of God says in regard to them but surely they are not really true I never found them to be really true now he said if you can produce for me one perfect man just one perfect man then I'll believe these promises well I said to him the facts are of course that uh, your faith does not depend upon somebody else's experience your faith depends upon your own experience now I'm not going to produce any perfect person in order to satisfy your demand I'm going to say rather instead that if you were the only person in the entire world who believed these promises then you'd experience them and would be the only person who did experience them and fortunately your salvation does not depend upon somebody else experiencing them first because you must go to yourself to receive those blessings from him now when God says that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength now what strength is being spoken of? physical mental and spiritual all three physical strength mental strength and spiritual strength and um, never will God lay upon us a burden so great as to be beyond the phys physical capacities which he will give to us now I did not say I did not say for a moment that uh, God will never lay upon us a burden beyond our, our physical strength because he'll do that for certain he'll very definitely do that he did it to Christ and if he did it to Christ he'll do it to us too but he'll never lay upon us, a, upon us a burden beyond the physical strength he will give us in order for us to do that work is there a difference? there very definitely is now for instance let's see how there was laid upon Jesus Christ a work beyond his physical power but not beyond the power that God would give him to do that work 
I turn to the book Ministry of Healing in which we have a statement in regard to the exhaustion that Christ suffered in consequence of his uh, warfare with the scribes and Pharisees and the incessant work that, that was called upon him to do page 55 in the book uh, Ministry of Healing and here it says the disciples who were associated with him in his work Jesus often released for a season that they might visit their homes and rest but in vain were their efforts to draw him away from his labours all day he ministered to the throngs that came to him and at eventide or in the early morning he went away to the sanctuary of the mountains for communion with his father often and not seldom but often his incessant labour and the conflict with the enmity and false teaching of his rabbis left him so utterly wearied that his mother and brothers and even his disciples feared that his life would be sacrificed now is that exhaustion that's fearful exhaustion when things are so bad when your weariness is so great that your, that your mother and brothers and even your disciples fear that your very life will be sacrificed that is a fearful expenditure of your physical energy which indicates of course that God was laying upon Jesus Christ a greater burden than his physical body could endure but let's see now what happens we read further on the same paragraph but as he returned from the hours of prayer that closed the toilsome day they marked a look of peace upon his face the freshness and life and power that seemed to pervade his whole being from hours spent alone with God he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men so when he had spent all that he had and was teetering on the brink of death from sheer exhaustion he simply went away and waited upon the Lord and what happened? did he renew his strength? Yes. he very much did did he, did he come forth walking as um, well, how's the text go again Isaiah 40 verse 21 it says uh, he, he mounted up with wings as an eagle he ran and was not weary he walked and he was not faint as he came back from those hours spent alone with God now there's further notes on this in the book Education this time page 18 and um, they will help us to, to further appreciate this point before I read these words I'd like to make an observation however a lesson which I learned a couple of years ago when I was back at the Arkansas camp meeting I've been to Germany and conducted a camp meeting there I, I flew across to California and began the camp with no break whatsoever the same day I began that camp by the time the second camp was over I was really exhausted I was in, in real serious trouble with my voice and I was so tired I didn't feel like doing anything but I said to myself well when I get to the Arkansas camp uh, I'll have four or five days rest in the meantime and I'll bounce back and be able, to be able to start over there as usual but I didn't bounce back after driving a car for those couple of thousand miles whatever it is it's about two thousand miles I just didn't feel any restoration of physical energy whatsoever and um, what I was having difficulty w with was realizing that it is quite normal for a person to be weary when you're doing the work of the Lord that there is an expenditure of strength which does leave you tired and worn out and it wasn't until I read the statement again the ministry of healing that I suddenly saw that there's nothing abnormal about being exhausted after you've been doing what God gives you to do that's quite a normal uh, result of that kind of labor or work and this cause for a realization that God has promised to supply the need which is caused by this expenditure now let's read this in regard to Jesus Christ on page 80 in the book Education it was not on the cross only that Christ sacrificed himself for humanity as he went about doing good Acts 10 verse 38 every day's experience was an outpouring of his life right every day's experience was an outpouring of his life now if you pour your life out what are you doing you're expending it aren't you you're spending your life you're burning up your life so you have less and less life remaining as each act of expenditure takes place now the statement goes on to say in one way only could such a life be sustained and inasmuch as the life of Christ was a holy life as Revelation chapter 3 points out it says he that is holy 
So inasmuch as the life of Christ was a holy life, and therefore he was an obedient child of God and a believing child of God, because as we read from Acts of the Apostles, page 51, holiness is what? Obedience and faith. Those two things. Now inasmuch as the life of Christ is to be our life, he says, follow me, take up your cross and follow me, then if we follow in Christ's footsteps and bear his cross after him, and, and find ourselves obeying God's commands and living a life of self-sacrificing service for God in which there will be no time to think of anything else, then will our lives also be an expenditure of our lives? Obviously. And we find ourselves exhausted and weary as he was. Now if, there's only, if there is only one way in which Christ's life could be sustained, then is there also only one way in which our lives can be sustained? Obviously. Now what is that one way? I now read it as we move on in this paragraph. Jesus lived in dependence upon God and communion with him. Now two things. Now let's, don't, don't let's miss those two things. He lived in dependence upon God and communion with him. So let's sort these two points out now. First of all, in what way did Jesus Christ depend upon God? He depended upon God for what? A message to preach? places to go or guidance as to where to go strength to do what God had given him to do so, so there was three things he depended upon God for in other words God was the plan maker God gave him his message and God gave him the strength to preach that message now he depended upon God for those two things but he knew he could not get what he depended upon God for without communion with God right now let's not miss that point that's, that's extremely important because now remember the commission to Jeremiah what did God say to Jeremiah back in chapter 1 you will go where I send you remember and you will preach what I give you to preach that was the commission given to Jeremiah the prophet and for the rest of his days he received the message from God and he went out and gave that wherever God sent him and it was the same with Jesus Christ of course so then we depend upon God for the message we preach, we depend upon God as to where we shall go to preach that message and we depend upon God to give us the strength to do that preaching, but you don't get those things you depend upon God for without a life of communion with God so, as, as Jesus Christ depended upon God for those things and he lived in communion with God through, those, through those, uh, that balance he gained the vitality and power he needed now Sister White turns aside for a moment to compare the life of Christ with the unfortunate lives of men and she says to the secret place of the most high under the shadow of the almighty men now and then repair they abide for a season and the result is manifest in noble deeds then their faith fails the communion is interrupted and the life work marred now this is the sad picture of humanity generally speaking of course there are exceptions fortunately um, Moses was not an exception he made he had two or three bad lapses two in particular one when he complained and God gave him the 70 elders to assist him in his work and the other occasion of course when he struck the rock on, on the borders of the promised land but we find that Daniel was one man who did not seem to ever lose that grip with, on God who maintained his communion and therefore his strength uh, as he communed with God from day to day but sadly we and we know this in our own experience we start off and we say right now I'm going to spend so much time in prayer every day with God prayer and Bible study and for a few days we, we manage to do it and then physical weariness gets the better of us and we let our communion lapse and when we do of course the life work is marred but not so with Christ the contrast with him was that the life of Jesus was a life of constant trust sustained by continual communion and his service for heaven and earth was without failure or faltering now, in other words if you want to have a service for heaven that is without failure and faltering what must you maintain a continual communion with God and an abiding sense of dependence upon him knowing that there is only one way in which a true Christian life can be sustained it is not by taking a four week vacation every year it's not by making sure you have 8 to 10 hours of sleep every night now 8 to 10 hours of sleep every night of course is, is maybe important for, for some folk 
but four weeks vacation is not necessary what does the Lord say six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work I remember back in the earlier days of my work one man in particular said oh, Fred you'll just have to take a vacation or you'll crack up you'll, you'll break down I said no I said I'm too busy that was about 15 years ago and I still haven't taken that vacation and I haven't cracked up either because I have learned I have learned the way in which such a life is to be sustained and I just don't have time to waste on four weeks vacation and so many books to write and so many so many preachings to take care of in various parts of the world field now when you're in regard to Christ it says on page 1881 as a man he supplicated the throne of God until his humanity was charged with a heavenly current that, that connected humanity with divinity receiving life from God he imparted life to men now I believe that um, we all probably need to have a much larger concept of the purpose of prayer of the purpose of communion now for the most part uh, the, the most primitive and um, un most unsatisfactory form of prayer is to, is to say our prayers kneel down every night and this is a kind of a duty that uh, father and mother impose upon us they say we should do it so we do it because they say we should do it and so we prattle off a set series of phrases and tumble into bed never giving the, never giving the thing a second thought right that's the beginnings of our prayer life and a very unfortunate beginning for the most part as we grow older we become very much uh, aware of a of a series of needs and um, the needs are for this and that problem to be solved that we may have protection on the journey and that kind of thing and we go and we ask God for all these things but we need to go beyond all that to the place where we go to God in prayer to to receive out of that prayer a physical personal experience and a spiritual experience to in the life of God actually flowing into us so receiving life from God we can in turn impart life to others we go to receive large infillings of God's love God's strength and God's life to give us the spiritual mental and physical fitness to do the work which God gives us to do and in the book Desire of Ages we find on page 362 and 363 that uh, on page 363 the actual paragraph we have just read is repeated with a little additional phrase which makes it very personal for us today 362 to 363 is our reference now <clears throat> and here's an answer by the way to those who might think they're too busy to spend time in prayer every day <clears throat> I read now on page 362 in regard to the busyness of Jesus Christ no other life was ever so crowded with labor and responsibility as was that of Jesus yet how often he was found in prayer how constant was his communion with God again and again in the history of his earth, earthly life are found records such as these and now we have a series of scripture texts quoted from Mark and Luke rising up a great while before day he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God now I certainly have not yet achieved an all night prayer session and anybody who says well I'm going to pray all night tonight is establishing a works program <laughs> because praying all night is something that develops and um, you grow up with no such thought in mind but you grow up with a great sense of need to lay hold upon God's life and power and you become so absorbed into the very presence of God that time ceases to mean anything and the hours go by and um, you spend that time with God without planning to spend that long in fact when I pray I depend upon the Holy Spirit to indicate me when the prayer should end which usually in my case is I don't, I don't pray much more than half to 45 minutes half an hour to 45 minutes um, in, in certain situations but this much I have found that as I spend more and more time in prayer with God that my ministry becomes much more successful and the camp meetings are much more blessed I notice than they were previously and I look forward to that wonderful day of course when every believer We'll come to camp, camp meetings spending three to four sessions per day of 15 to 20 minutes to half an hour each pleading with God 
under the terms that we're learning about here, reaching out and laying hold upon God for life and for vitality, if we all came to camp charged with the love of God, what a wonderful camp it would really be. Marvellous. And I hope that day comes before too many more camps go by. Now, reading further in regard to the ministry and life of Christ, in a life wholly devoted to the good of others, the Saviour found it necessary to withdraw from the thoroughfares of travel and from the throng which followed him day after day. He must turn aside from a life of ceaseless activity in contact with human needs to seek retirement and unbroken communion with his Father. As one with us, a sharer in our needs and weaknesses, he was wholly dependent upon God. And in the secret place of prayer, he sought divine strength that he might go forth braced for duty and trial. Now this divine strength was physical, mental and spiritual. We, we tend to say spiritual, but it was divine in the sense that the life flowed out of God into the human body of Jesus Christ until that body became charged with a heavenly current or a stream of life or a spirit of life that connected humanity with divinity, as the next paragraph says. Now I read on, In a world of sin, Jesus endured struggles and torture of soul. In communion with God, he could unburden the sorrows that were crushing him. Here he found comfort and joy. Now I read again the statement which we had back in the book Education. There's a little bit more to it in the book Desire of Ages. In Christ, the cry of humanity reached the father of infinite pity. As a man, and those three words must be of great importance to us because we're men and women too, so if Christ could do it as a man, then what can we do as men and women? Yes. Same thing precisely. So as a man, he supplicated the throne of God till his humanity was charged with a heavenly current that should connect humanity with divinity. Through continual communion he received life from God that he might impart life to the world. His experience is to be ours, right? His experience is to be ours. The same life of communion, the same laying hold of God's power, the same revitalization of physical, mental and spiritual energies that Jesus Christ experienced is to be our experience too. Now I would, I would say... I was thinking of, I think of a question which has been asked of me too in this particular particular respect. Now some people say, now if I miss my prayer life for one day, what happens? Uh, well, some people think that we go right back to base again. That's not true. Because there's a kind of a cumulative of effect that's gained by a life of continual communion with God. Now sometimes, for instance, when I, found, when I find myself um, in certain situations I just can't find the opportunity to get away at any time during the day to, to spend time in prayer when you're travelling hard um, with other people and you're for instance you travel all day in a car and you come to a, um, a campground and you just roll up in a sleeping bag and at 4 o'clock morning you're up and away again but there's much chance to spend a lot of time in prayer in those situations and during the day and by faith, of course, I simply ask God to extend the blessings of yesterday so they cover today as well. But when we miss a day's prayer, either through carelessness or, or even through unavoidable difficulties, we don't go right back to, to point A again, to the very base or the beginning. It's the same as um, when you miss a day's food. You don't drop dead, do you? <laughs> Some people think they might. <laughs> But um, there has been a, a reserve in, stored up in your body over all these months and months of good eating and when you miss a day's food, of course, you feel hungry and weak. You can't function as efficiently, perhaps, but you're still very much a living person. So likewise with your prayer life, when you, don't, when you miss a day's prayer, don't think it's the end of the world exactly because you will have lost some ground, you won't function quite as efficiently, but you haven't lost everything. And you don't have to go right back to base again to start all over again. So there is a cumulative effect and this life of communion, communion also has a moulding effect upon your character. It changes you into a different kind of person from what you were previously and surrounds you with a very sacred influence which in turn proves to be a soul-saving power to those who surround you. I'd like to read a statement from um, the book Christ Object Lessons in regard to the talent of influence which um, comes to us on page 339 
And whether you know it or not, the fact is, as I read now, that every soul is surrounded by an atmosphere of its own. An atmosphere, it may be, charged with the life-giving power of faith, courage and hope, and sweet with the fragrance of love. Or it may be, heavy and chill with the gloom of discontent and selfishness, or poisonous with the deadly taint of cherished sin. By the atmosphere surrounding us, every person with whom we come in contact is consciously or unconsciously affected. And naturally, if you want your influence to be a soul-saving influence, you must spend time in prayer with God every day. Now, read a little further on page 363 in regard to the life of communion we are to enjoy with God. Come ye yourselves apart, he bids us. If we would give heed to his word, we should be stronger and more useful. The disciples sought Jesus and told him all things, and he encouraged and instructed them. If today... We, we would take time to go to Jesus and tell him our needs. We should not be disappointed. He would be at our right hand to help us. We need more simplicity, more trust and confidence in our Saviour. He, his name is called the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He of whom it is written, the government shall be upon his shoulder, is the Wonderful Counselor. We are invited to ask wisdom of him. He giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not. Isaiah 9, verse 6, and James 1, verse 5. Now please note very carefully the words of this next paragraph, the very last in the chapter. It says, In all who are under the training of God, let me stop right there, are we under God's training at the present time? Are we? These are days of preparation. Our real mission, our real work, of course, lies ahead during the period of Jacob's trouble. And today the mystery of our mission is being unfolded to us in the messages that God bring, brings to us day by day. So therefore, we are the very people about whom this paragraph is written. Those who are under the training of God. In, in all such is to, is to be revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs or its practices. And everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speak into the heart. When every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. Now, for years and years I more or less accepted the, uh, the simple explanation of these words. When every other voice is hushed to simply mean that while other folk were sleeping in their beds and I had the quietness of the house to myself at 5 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning, then I could more distinctly hear the voice of God. But my son Lindsay wrote to me a few days ago and he mentioned this particular statement and gave it to a different interpretation which I accept as being a far better one than what I, what I had previously seen myself. And when you find yourself in an hour of need and you have a problem facing you, then into your head comes a number of voices and each of those voices offers to you a solution or a possible solution to your problem. In other words, there's a whole bunch of plan makers and, and, you, and you are, of course, the supreme plan maker by allowing all these ideas to enter into your mind. Now, as I have preached before, of course, the very first step in giving a problem to God is to, first of all, rid our mind of these other voices, right? The voices of doubt, the voices of uncertainty, the voice of fear, the voice of, um, of expectancy, any other voice you'd like to name. Let's get rid of all those other voices and let the mind be in tune with the voice of God and the voice of God alone. Now maybe the other people may be making noise around you, but that doesn't matter. That, that, that doesn't intrude upon your communion with God, although it's certainly much nicer to be completely alone and in a world of silence when you are talking with God so there's no physical distractions either. But these other voices, when every other voice is hushed, now if you think in terms of those voices being the voices of other plans, other ideas, fears, expectancies, doubts, irresolution and so forth, then when those voices are hushed, and only when those voices are hushed can you more, more distinctly hear the voice of God. Obviously, of course, you never truly hear the voice of God if you're distracted by fear, can you? Or if you're distracted by uncertainty or perplexity. That those voices are hushed then we can certainly hear the voice of God much more distinctly. He bids us be still and know that I am God. Now the very 
uh, presence of that text from Isaiah, from Psalms 46 verse 10 be still that when you have fear when the voice of fear is there when the voice of uncertainty is there when the voice of worry is there when the voice of perplexity is there then are you still in the presence of God do you have peace? no, no you don't you have unrest but the command is be still and know that I am God here alone can true rest be found and this is the effectual preparation for all who labour for God amid the hurrying throng and the strain of life's intense activities the soul who is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace the life will breathe out fragrance and will reveal a divine power that will reach men's hearts and that of course is a very wonderful and very precious assurance for those of us who are at the present time reaching out to develop a richer and more positive spiritual experience those of us who desire to enter into a life of holiness which is as we've learned obedience and trust that is what a holy life is and uh, a great deal of our time this week of course we spent developing that point learning what it means to live a holy life by looking at the life of Jesus Christ in due time now with these thoughts in mind let's come back now to um, the statement in regard to taking the kingdom of God by violence that violence which will bring its own reward which we read about of course in Matthew chapter 11 let's just go back there to refresh our minds and uh, tie together all we have been talking about over the past few minutes Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12 and from the days of John the Baptist till now the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force and as Sister White says in the statement in the Bible commentary we would take it by force as did Jacob a little further down um, our supplication would be full of earnestness full of a sense of our great need and we would not be denied right now this refusal to be denied is a very essential part of taking the kingdom of heaven by violence so let's put together now the key words taken from this particular paragraph we would come before God with a sense of our great need right that's the first thing now the needs are going to differ from person to person what will parents recognize as their great need if they have unruly children the need for the spirit of obedience to be put into those children right so now when a parent is struggling with an unruly child a disobedient child a child with a spirit of rebellion and the parent knows the promise of God where God says I will save your children what was that reference again we found it for someone before from Isaiah who did I find it for thank you very much 49.25 let's uh, turn back to that wonderful statement Isaiah 49 verse 25 but thus saith the Lord even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered for I will contend with him that contendeth with thee and I will save thy children so now there's the need and there's the promise right so now when we know the need at the same time we must know the promise now when God makes a specific promise like that <clears throat> and we have a, a desperate sense of need we know that, 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 that the child must be brought to the place where he is saved by the power of the gospel from the presence in him of the spirit of obedience so the spirit of, from the spirit of disobedience now just a minute let me get this straight when we know that the child can only experience salvation and needs the gospel to save him from the spirit of dis disobedience which is in him then we come before God with a tremendous sense of need but at the same time a tremendous sense of trust and faith in that promise and we say to the Lord I have this need and tell God what that need is and, and this is the kind of prayer I would find myself praying in a situation like this and of course if it's a baby I'd be praying right there in the baby's presence if it's the baby that's in trouble or in the child's presence if it's a, if it's a child that's in trouble in this respect I was saying now Lord here we have an immense problem with, with ramifications which, which are for time and for eternity and this child's life is in the balance in other words if the victory is not gained this child shall perish if it is gained he will be saved and so Lord there's a tremendous need now the problem is Lord that this child has in him or her as the case may be the spirit of disobedience 
But Lord, you have promised. You have promised to put into my child the spirit of obedience. And I believe that promise. <clears throat> and then tell the Lord that, that you come to receive that promise and you will not, you will not be refused. You, you will not give up until you receive that gift. As Sister, <clears throat> pardon me, as Sister White says here in this statement, we would not be denied. And tell the Lord you come for that gift because he's promised to give you that gift and you will not take no for an answer. Why? Because he's promised it, hasn't he? Now when you cling to God in that way and lay fast hold upon that promise, then what are you doing? You're taking the kingdom of heaven by violence. As Sister Y says, that violence which will bring its own reward. And what is the reward? The promise, which is salvation for whom? For your children. Right? As, as God then applies the, the living gospel to bring that, uh, that blessing to you. Now I remember going back to the Arkansas camp of about two years ago, I mentioned the fact that I arrived there destitute of energy. I began the, the meetings and by Sabbath afternoon I could barely, uh, barely function. I was so exhausted from the work of preaching. And at that point of time, this, the promises opened up to me in, in a new and wonderful way. And... Uh, almost, well I guess I was very excited about the promise, they were so real to me and I really believed them and I hurried away to my favourite prayer spot excited with the, with the real thought and belief that God would give me that promise. And I knelt down and told God my need for wisdom and strength to do his work I reached out and laid hold of the promise and I said Lord I have come for that blessing and I will not let you go except you give it to me, I will not be denied I will not take no for an answer because I must have the strength to do the work which you give me to do. And um, it brought us own reward because every trace of physical weariness disappeared, every trace of it. I went away from that prayer spot literally revitalized and the fulfillment of the promise was mine. I went back then, my voice was strong. I went to the end time at the Arkansas camp. We had a most blessed time together. And while I had to come back a number of times to, to gain fresh reserves of strength, I ended up that camping with a stronger voice than, than, than that which I had begun. And as I stand before you folk today, I stand here with a fifth camp meeting in six weeks, plus of course a week in Walla Walla as well in the meantime. And as you can hear my voice, does not giving me any trouble whatsoever. And that's not because of any virtue on my part, it's because I have learned to believe these promises and to claim those promises and to experience them. Right, we have just a few moments left, so let me <coughs> look at this table a little further. Now, Sister Wise says, first of all, in the Bible Comedy, page, volume 5, page 1089, you already have the reference, I'm sure, we've quoted from it several times now. With the great truth <coughs> we have been privileged to receive, we should, and under the Holy Spirit, Spirit's power, we could become living channels of light. Now let's think today of the messages God has sent to us over the years, and would we say that we have been given great truth as a privilege, or received, received the great truth as a privilege from God during these years? Right, have we? In fact, this message is exactly designed to prepare people for the coming conflict, and is perfect suitability for that purpose vindicates the fact of course it came from God and no one else but him and the end result of these great truths will be the production of the Philadelphian people and the glorious finishing of God's work in all this world of sin so let's be very very grateful to him that he is doing this work and as surely as he's doing this work then of course the promises are for us we can rely upon the fact that every provision which God has made to complete the work will be made available to us in response to living prayers of faith Right, well, there's a bell again, so I guess we have to stop at this point. Any questions you'd like to ask on this particular presentation? Is there any proof of uh, the Philadelphian Church being the last church? Because some say that... Well, may remember that in the very first study period yesterday morning, I showed how that the promises to the Philadelphian Church will only be fulfilled to that people who are in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's when the wicked will come and bow before our feet. That's when um, we'll be safe from the hour of temptation, for instance. And those promises have not been fulfilled anywhere in the past and they'll only be, be fulfilled to a people during Jacob's trouble. Okay. 
and therefore the Philadelphian church is the final church. Any other questions? The reference on um, those who are under the training.